Um, all right, we start with news that um, Tis the Bomb, uh, a horse trained in America by Kenny McPeak, who carries the colours of Phoenix Thoroughbreds, is, is out of all British classics. What's your thoughts on that, Dave Yates? Right, well, there, there, are, there are two aspects of this, Tom. One is the particular horse, Tis the Bomb, and also the other would be to look at this issue in a wider context. Just specifically with Tis the Bomb... Um, he held entries in both the Kipco 2000 Guineas and the Kazoo Derby. He's trained by Kenny McPeak, of course, in America, and he's owned uh, by um, Amir Abdulaziz Salman, the, the boss of Phoenix Thoroughbreds, who, of course, has been in the news an awful lot over the last couple of years, most notably when a, a US Department of Justice judge... Uh, named him as the the central bi the central figure in a what was essentially a, a four billion dollar cryptocurrency scam essentially wasn't it yeah. and uh it, obviously he protests his innocence um this this has created a, poten a potential embarrassment in the the uh the the, the phoenix thoroughbred um horses not being allowed to run, um, Kenny McPeak himself took uh, the horse out of uh, the, the British Classics and said that uh, he will run in the Kentucky Derby. Um, widening this out, is this a course of action that the trainer has to be relied upon to make or should the BHA step in and say, no, that horse can't run. I personally think that that is, whilst in this instance it, it seems like a good idea, that also, it seems to me, would open up a can of worms whereby there are quite a lot of owners that you'd say, well, we don't want, we, we don't want Mr X's horses running here, um, the BHA should prevent them from running, and I, I think that would create a, a pretty pretty difficult precedent. I think it would open something of a of a can of worms. Moving on to our uh, next talking point, which is the gambling review. Each and every week this comes up. The, wh wh when are we seeing the white paper? Right, well, we're going to miss the gambling review uh, when it's finally over, aren't we? Because, you know, oh, when... Oh, when, when, when uh, we're going to miss it on this talking point. When we're trying to get to seven talking <coughs> points, we can always... It turns <coughs> up like an old friend, just yeah. when you're feeling down on your luck. A really um, good friend. Now, obviously, this week... It being Grand National Week, there has been a concerted push within the industry, hasn't there, uh, to bring because because circulation figures for uh, the Racing Post, for example, viewership figures for um, for the the TV are high because it's Grand National Week, mm. and so the the industry quite understandably has um, marshaled its forces. So that uh, the Mirror was contacted um, by uh, the British Gaming Council as to whether we wanted to put something in on Saturday, which unfortunately we didn't have space for, but we will do um, in, uh, in in coming weeks, I hope. Lawrence Robertson, was, was uh, the, the MP for Tewkesbury, was quoted in the trade paper saying that the battle is not over yet. Uh, broadly, racing feels that it could... It could suffer a hit that it can ill afford up to 100 million quid or even more in some estimates if restrictions are placed on gambling. We're, we're obviously keen to separate um, gaming on slots etc from so-called uh, games of skill whereby um, in horse racing um, we consider that a different thing. So Everyone's been out in force this week to um, to try and tell their readers we mustn't we mustn't suffer this hit because we're different uh, to activities such as um, uh, gambling on slots. Uh, is it how many? Is it thirty million people are are, are reckoned to uh, to gamble occasionally or, or to gamble on horse racing? Mm. If the restrictions come in, such as affordability checks, etc., then that will have a negative impact on the sport, and it will obviously see 
trainers, etc., leave. And um, just to flesh that out, RMG, the parent company of this channel, Racing TV, are, are seeking to educate MPs in the build-up to the release of this, this gambling review. It, uh, it, depending on who you speak to, it, 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 it ranges from absolute doom and gloom to just fear, but there's certainly no, nobody's being particularly positive about it. No, well I think, you know, the, it's been said in the, in the House of Commons that, um, that the, the, the government is mindful of uh, the negative impact that horse racing would suffer and that it's, it's, it's anxious that that would not happen. On the other side of the coin, everyone in our industry is keen to push until the very last, aren't they? That, you know, that there is no, there's no room for complacency whereby mm. we say, oh, you know, the, the, gov the gambling minister told us we had nothing to worry about, so we're OK. Um, Jack Barber, young trainer, um, gonna gonna hang up his his tra I don't know what you hang up training hat. I don't know, <laughs> jockey, you hang up your boot. Anyway, he's, not, yeah. he, he's sadly he's not going to be training anymore, which is a great shame. Um, you know, the, Jerry is, is a young trainer who was um, enjoying a reasonably good time of it, but can't seem to get the horses, can't can't seem to afford to train anymore, which is a great shame. Yeah, I suppose, and I suppose on the back of like big festivals like Cheltenham and Aintree, we see all the good, the good stories, the big, you know, the big trainers, the small trainers, the big owners who have winners. But there's always, you know, every time someone's having a good day, there's plenty of lads having bad days, and with training, you know, like the horses themselves are probably the easiest part of it. Mm -hmm. It's the, probably the finances and and owners and stuff like that's probably very tough. And it's a shame, Jack. Very, he's very, like I said, he's only young. He's only thirty. Thirty, yeah. 30 very young man. And, like, no doubt he'll find a nice, good job in, in the in industry, but it's just a shame that he's having to pack up so soon. Do you think it's par for the course that, you know, each and every year we have the odd trainer who stops? Or do, do you feel it, it might just be happening more and more amongst a, a trainers in a certain bracket? Yeah, and I suppose we have to remember what's going on in the world as well at the moment with the price of everything going up, whether it's fuel or, you know, even just, you know, I'm sure minimum wages and all, every sort of wages have to go up and... Yeah, like it's just very tough, and it's just like training horses. It's you know, something never appealed to me too much, but yeah, it's just a real shame that Jack had to back up so so young. It's I, 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 very sadly, I think this is something that we're going to see more and more of for for two reasons. I think one is that there does seem to be a sort of gravitation towards the big stables. Some of the some of the yards seem mm. to have more than ever before, and th the middle. And the lower end are being squeezed, I think. But the other thing is, as Jerry's just said, that the cost of the cost of everything yeah. is going up, and it's going to go up a lot more, isn't it? And that means, um, I mean, Jack Barber said, what was it? Um, bedding, fuel, feed. Those things have have gone up in price. They will continue to go up. People's ability to pay is reduced because their their outgoings are up and uh, regrettably this is a situation i think that's going to get that's going to get consistently worse before it, if it ever does get better and obviously i hope it does but it's going to get worse first i fear the trainers championship was seen as a, i suppose a four way duel going into Aintree, although willie mullins had pointed out that he probably needed to finish first or second in the grand national to be a feature for it jerry is it done and dusted um, I suppose with my seven barrows hat on, I'm going to say no, hopefully not. Um, I don't know what the figure is actually today, but like you said, going into entry, it was definitely, you know, we were go like seven barrows were definitely going for it, you know, and we ran as many horses as we could in, in the race we thought we could win. Um, hence, like, like even like Epiton going for two and a half, that was probably a deciding factor mm -hmm. whether to whether to go to punch down or there. And she, she bagged it and John Bond winning. And hopefully, like I said, there's, there's two weeks left. Um, We'll know this day two weeks, and like I said, it's an exciting time, and it'd be brilliant for the sport, brilliant for the industry, brilliant for like just racing in general. If it did go down to the last day at Sandown, um, we'd probably be running about seven in every race. We'd probably be very busy, but like I said, I, I hope it goes down to the wire because you know um, they're both brilliant trainers and they both deserve to win it. There's two hundred sixty-seven thousand, I think, between um, yeah. Ditchit and Seven Barrows. Yeah, and, and that went up from one hundred and fifty grand at the start. It was it was really interesting going into that. Um, Nick Luck and I were talking about the, um, the 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 trainer's title going into Aintree, and at the start of Aintree, Nicky Henderson was about fifteen to eight best, I think, and Paul Nichols was about four to nine, and 
we both we agreed that we thought Seven Barrows had a right chance if the concerns that Paul Nichols had expressed about the form of his horses came to pass. And in the end, they did and they didn't really, mm. didn't they? I mean, like, it's 140 grand for uh, Clondis Oboe. And then, of course, the, the problem was for Seven Barrows. Clear horses. Yeah, there's mm. a. Nichols hits Henderson with a right, there's a cross counter, but guess what? You've got the two the two digit horses, a, a second and third, McFabulous and um, the other one. Montmorel. Montmorel. And, and so that really cushions the blow, doesn't it? And hit the second and the Fox Hunter yeah, as well. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. So, I, you know, I, I think it's... It, uh, it, it was the three days was of just it was like a real battleground state wasn't it for the uh, for the trainers title and the way that it's gone I, I looked at the betting when I was um, when I was out in the middle of this program and I, I couldn't find I couldn't find anything on it now well, so it, the bookies at least think it's done and dusted a key hope for seven barrows at the end of the season could have been Shishkin in, in a celebration chase for example it, uh, so um, I'd actually missed this a little bit earlier on in the week uh, Jerry's been diagnosed with a a rare bone disease is that right can you tell us a bit more yeah i suppose i suppose it's fairly obvious at Cheltenham. you know everyone like there was something amiss really i know initially the ground was blamed or whatever but he, he just wasn't there was no spark whatsoever and he, he came back and i suppose for a day or two we were still thought it was the ground and then he just you know he just showed us signs that he wasn't right he wasn't mm. right in himself um and obviously you know rightly so he was sent off for all the checks needed and he did every scan and everything you can imagine done to a racehorse. Um, yeah, and thank like it's one of those. It's obviously it's not a great thing, but at least something came to light because we were like we were genuinely scratching our heads, really kind of wondering was it just the ground or what was it on the day or. But at least something has come to light, and, and hopefully it's nothing. You know, he should what, be back. What does next it mean? Season. What does it? Mean? Well, to be honest, I wouldn't like I said with the entry and everything like this this week. I haven't got into the depths of it too much now either. But I I'd, like and, the, and you're not a vet. That's exactly, I, I think that's <laughs> probably the enough. safest thing for me to say. But yeah, like I said, there was a, they did a bone scan. There was a few kind of areas that they were worried about. But I'd, I'd never heard of the disease before, and I don't think many other people had either. And it's just one of those things. But it, I'm kind of of the, the opinion at least something's come to light, mm. and like there should be no reason he's not back next season and better than ever. I think there are there are two. Um, when, a, when a horse, when a champion underperforms to that extent, there are two things that you want to know. First of all, finding a reason, isn't it? Which is a yeah. comfort that you think, right, okay, well, we found what was wrong. And the second, is it treatable? And so the answer to those questions is, yes, there was something wrong. It's rare, but yes, it's treatable. So hopefully, it, it, interesting, one of the thing I thought was interesting was that... Um, in, in this situation, Nicky Henderson could easily have said, when he was asked about, right, what plans for next year, he could easily have said, mate, don't ask me about plans for next year. Right, let's get this treatment out of the way first. And he didn't say that. He said, right, well, the Tingle Creek is mm. the first race that we're aiming for, and then we will move forward from there. So at least in the trainer's mind, he's positive thinking, OK, we found an issue, the vets say they can deal with it, and hopefully we're in, what are we in now, April, l throwing it forward four, five, six, seven months, we'll then be, with a following li wind, we'll, we'll be able to resume where we were pre-Cheltenham, which was a, an un unbeaten two-miler, who's one of the best horses we've seen in recent decades, I mm. suppose. Um, talking of champions... Brian Hughes, I, th I feel like halfway through the summer, Dave, we sort of crowned him champion jockey again off the back of missing out last year. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and, and with good reason, because he was, he was so far clear. The, this is an interesting one, I think, and Jerry, your take on this, I, I think, mm. will, will be really instructive. That uh, This has happened on the flat as well with the, the, sometimes the, the top jockeys numerically who are also riding big winners aren't getting near you know rides in the derby yeah. and and such like and it's a real shame that brian hughes was riding at bangor on grand national afternoon obviously the cheltenham festival he said well there's you know there's no point really in 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 i think he said like wasting diesel yeah. uh, to come down to ride and it, it's a it's a great shame for the sport that the the champion jockey and someone of Brian Hughes' skills isn't part of the Grand National meeting. 
Yeah, and I suppose it might just come back to what you what we touched on earlier, just the dominance of these big stables, especially the big meetings and the bigger races. Like obviously Brian and Donald McCain, they've had an incredible two or three seasons, and they're just going from strength to strength. Like Donald McCain, like just because he wasn't riding there this year, doesn't mean they won't be there next year. Like Donald McCain, he bought three or four horses again at the sales on Thursday night. Um, like they're really on a, an upward curve, both of them. Well, Brian has been for a long time, so is Donald. But Donald's really getting back up into the heights where he was, and back to the days he did his peddlers cross and all those proper grade one horses. And I do think it's only around the corner before we do see them on the you know on the top stage again. Was he? He's the most prolific trainer in terms of numbers, Donald McCain mm. this season, I think, isn't he? And so 152, I'm hearing. So with that, as you say, hopefully will come additional momentum, money to spend at the sales, whereby th there is there is a bit more quality to go with the quantity, and hopefully that will mean that we see Brian Hughes at, at these big meetings, because he, you know, he, he's such a great jockey to ride, isn't he, that yeah, at brilliant. these marquee events, we want to see, we want to see the mm. best jockeys of which he's... Donald McCain at... Um I think it was on trials day when he had four runners at Cheltenham. Uh, I interviewed him, and you know he sort of joked, "Oh yeah, seeing me at Cheltenham's a rarity," you know, because in recent years he hasn't been there so much. But I guess at the moment it's a geographical thing. At the moment, while the champion jockey resides in the north and mainly rides in the north, we, even though Aintree is in the north, perhaps we're not going to see them at the at the bigger meetings um, throughout the year for now. But as you say, hopefully that's going to change going forward. Definitely, the, the, the bell has rung. Um, stewards is our last point and it's not that I don't know exactly what we're going to be discussing here but I'm just going to throw that to Dave Right, well we're going to talk about the stewards inquiry to the, the four year old anniversary hurdle in which Pied Piper and Knight Salute it, what an incredibly dramatic half hour that was yeah. because um, first of all there's a dead heat this was one thing we, we, we this was, to me, an, an early sort of red herring with the Gordon Elliott form because I thought this horse was travelling all over Night Salute and then had to make do with a share of the spoils, or so it seemed, when the judge couldn't separate the pair as they crossed the line. You saw there Pied Piper had gone to his left and, well, as, the, as it was a dead heat, any measure of interference surely was crucial. I think that. without a doubt. That, that, so it's a point I tried to, you know, I put to Milton, and I know he didn't, you know, necessarily want to go there. But Jerry had Knight Salute been beaten a nose, he'd have got the race in the stewards' room. Yeah, right, rightly. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, I, yeah. He, the, that's, if you look at it that way, yeah, I agree. You know, he would have. But I suppose just one of those <laughs> Knight Salute. He, it is a long run from the back, of the last to the line, and I suppose he had plenty of opportunity to get back in front but like I said he was he was hindered a small bit the last but what I just took from it was just the respect the two jockeys had yeah. for each other in the weighing room and like there's pros and cons obviously Davey you know lost the race but I think from a racing's point of view the way that ITV covered the jock, uh, the, um, the Shures Inquiry was great TV and I think it was great for the public to see it but I just what I just thought was so important the respect the two senior jockeys had for each other was just incredible and it was a very beautiful thing by Paddy Brennan, as we'd seen at Cheltenham, in a in a in a modern era of cynicism in sport, footballers falling over when no one's touched them, cricketers applying oil to the edges of their bats so that hot spot doesn't show. We could go through all we could go through all sports, and it's a beautiful thing to see a, a jockey like Paddy Brennan say at Cheltenham and here. It didn't mm. make any difference. And it triggered a wider debate as to, well, look, if that's what the jockeys say, why can't the stewards just say, right, that's good enough for us? But, throwing it forward, just imagine if we had a situation whereby there was some two-bit selling race somewhere and one jockey said to the other, listen, um, if you say there was no telling interference here, you will be very look, well looked after after. Uh, God forbid that that should ever happen. But you know what I mean. Like the, what the what the jockeys say is merely evidence. Yes. it's not conclusive, yeah. and, it, and it can never be conclusive. Yeah, beautiful. And it will to always watch. boil down to an element of personal opinion. Y yeah, beautiful to watch that. You know, say that Paddy Brennan would say. You know, it, it's it's just such a a lovely antidote to everything that we see in, in big money professional sport day in day out but in terms of being 
the be all and end all as far as the officials are concerned it shouldn't have been and widening it out it never can be that's it for this week's talking points